What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Hi there, my fellow poker enthusiasts, and welcome back to another episode here on the Mechanics of Poker podcast. If you have played online poker, chances are you have faced a Russian guy who seems to understand the game a little bit better than you did and took all your money. Today we are going to talk to one of them, Sergi Nikiforov aka Munistar will join us on the pod. He is a high stakes online cash game player for over seven years and nowadays plays all the way up to 100k and L. So that means that the big blind is a thousand dollar. That's a lot of money. He has a master's degree in applied mathematics and physics and has gained experience playing games pre-poker by competing in Warcraft 3. He told me he has probably experienced everything a poker player can go through and agreed to come on our podcast to share what he has learned throughout his career so you guys and girls can learn a thing or two and probably try and prevent mistakes that he has made. Adam, in your hats up, City Go Times, any Russian player that you remember that kicked your butt? Yeah, like most people listening, I'm sure you can relate to uh, playing Russian players who are very good. There's a player that comes to mind called VBV1990, who was a very aggressive Russian heads up sitting goal rag. And yeah, he was a nightmare to play against, would always put you in tough spots, had that right balance of aggression, but also not overdoing it. And yeah, I think the aggressive, the Russian regulars, from my perspective, were always on the aggressive side. I didn't play many passive Russian regulars, but that could just be a, a sample size. But yeah, there's obviously a lot of really established good Russian players. And yeah, I think their world's often not spoken about enough and we don't really know as, as much about the Russian world as we should. So uh, today's guest will be very interesting. Hopefully we can understand why the Russians have been so successful in online poker and live poker. And yeah, his journey's been a long one, 12 years in total. So lots of stories and lots of wisdom to share. He's playing super, super high nosebleeds right now, which we want to really dig into how he's got there and also what it's like to play uh, some of the high stakes in the game. And yeah, really excited to see where the conversation goes. Yeah, it was actually similar to the last the last podcast we did with Jose, also the Andorian community always crushes as well. And it's kind of the same with the Russian community. It's a bit, we don't really know what's going on there. Uh, so yeah, that's why I was very excited to have Jose on the last podcast and now to have Sergi on in this podcast. Uh, for the people that decided to join the Mechanics of Poker program, we had a promotion last month, went very well. A lot of people decided to join in. Very great for that. Very happy to try to help you on your journeys. Sorry for the other guys that missed out, but we are working quite hard on the Mechanics of Poker 2.0 behind the scenes, which will be released somewhere in September. So keep an eye out on that. Without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Sergi. Welcome, Sergi, to the pod. Kakdila, Russian for how are you? I learned. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, yeah, things are pretty well. Um, yeah, I'm currently in Thailand and the weather is fantastic outside, uh, roughly 30 degrees. So the sun is shining despite uh, the um, usually uh, ra a little bit rainy at this time of the year. So yeah, I'm pretty happy to be on your podcast. Um, yeah, I can imagine that Thai, it's a, a tropical culture, it's something completely different than I think you're originally from Moscow, where it gets what minus 30 degrees in winter, if not more. Well, it used to be like that a couple of decades ago. However, nowadays it's a little bit more 
uh, moderate, I would say. So minus 20 is uh, the lowest temperature that we got last winter. Long live global warming, the, the people from Moscow say. Like, oh, minus 20. Great. <laughs> we, we, we want higher temperatures like that. Uh, it's actually good weather to play a lot of online poker. Maybe this is also a secret to uh, to the Russian success in the online poker streets, right? Minus 20. Yeah, what, what else are you going to do? Um, well, you can do plenty of things. Uh, for example, I can remember myself playing football outdoors when it was minus 20. So, yeah. But yeah, speaking of online poker, yeah, in winter, these are usually the days where you put the largest number of hours in definitely yeah yeah i i can imagine it's funny how it's always relative right cold i lived in rio de janeiro for a while and there they ask like in the netherlands wow it gets zero degrees do you even go outside and now you're mentioning minus 20 degrees you go outside to play football so it's all relative to like the temperature that you're used to and what you think is cold uh, or hot um i wanted to start off the pot pre-poker uh you mentioned that you played quite a lot of warcraft 3 when you were younger and i was curious was this the first strategy game you really got into or have strategy games always been a big part of your childhood um i guess uh, i played a little bit of chess when i was a kid like even preschool i played uh, against my father <laughs> but uh, yeah other than chess, yeah, Warcraft 3 was my uh, first strategy game that I spent a lot of hours playing. And yeah, um, I started playing when, uh, when I was, I guess, 12 or so. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the journey was maybe eight years long. So oh, wow, quite, eight years. Uh, yeah, quite... Uh, Quite a significant period of my life I spent playing Warcraft 3. Did you also compete in uh, in any tournaments or something like that? Or how does it work in Warcraft 3? Um, well, initially, there was this um, um, matchmaking system or mm -hmm. ma matchmaking um, server that was called Battle.net. And so you look in with your account and then you click the search button and then the system automatically finds you uh, a rival to compete against, right? Ah. Uh, so that was the early days of my Warcraft 3, let's say, career. Uh, but afterwards, uh, more and more uh, online tournaments began to emerge. And yeah, I played um, tournaments as well, even won a couple of them. Oh, but nice. You know, you know, you know these were like small tournaments, not, nothing major. So you, what was it about uh, strategy games like Work of Three? You mentioned a little bit of chess that in intrigued you and that probably still intrigues you up until today since, you know, you still play poker. Well, um, that's a very nice question. I would guess um, all of the games that I have played um, they, they gave me an opportunity to, uh, to think a lot. So uh, there was a lot of wisdom in terms of the actions you can make. So, uh, and probably that complexity of the games uh, uh, was, was something that won me over when I started playing them. So it's like the complexity and then after after you play the match, match to analyze, hey, what did he do? You're very, very interested in getting better? Um, well, yeah, the analysis was uh, an integral part of the Warcraft uh, uh, career. And I, I can't say that I analyzed every single game that I played, but maybe like 20 to 30% of the games that I played were then replayed. And um, yeah, I looked for the uh, things that I didn't do well, mm -hmm. the things that uh, I could have improved in. And yeah, eventually I became stronger, stronger. Guys, secret to success, analyze your games, try to find leaks and improve. So it's, it's, ve it's very similar to poker. This is probably the analytical skills that you develop maybe through Warcraft and uh, through knowing how to improve, this is probably something that has helped you in your poker career as well, I assume. 
Well, yeah, um, and so uh, another uh, factor to talk about that is similar in poker and Warcraft uh, studying um, is that um, uh, you really need to put a lot of hours in in order to uh, to become successful uh, at a certain level. So uh, you can't, let's say, uh, start playing and in one month become a player who can crush the uh, top regulars in both games, right? So you need uh, quite a bit of patience and uh, yeah, dedication in order to to achieve some significant results there. And I guess you really need to enjoy that process, right? Because as you said, uh, it can take quite a while before you actually start to win tournaments or reach the high stakes. So in the meanwhile, you really have to enjoy that process, right? Like you said, that it's difficult and you, you put your mind into spots where it really has to think. You really have to enjoy that process. I assume there's no Warcraft 3 solver. I mean, I could be wrong here, but how, like how, how, how do you then study? Do you meet up with other players? Do, do you then share your screen, rewatch together? Well, um, I guess initially the approach was the trial and error approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and as time went on, um, I, I reached, let's say, uh, a mediocre level. Then I started watching the games of uh, the best players in the world in order to get an idea what they are doing uh, that is different uh, from what I was doing at that point. And yeah. Um, you mentioned one thing that there is uh, no GTO uh, in Warcraft 3. I would guess uh, there is one guy, probably the best uh, nowadays in Warcraft 3, uh, whose name is Dmitry Kostin, aka Happy. Mm -hmm. uh, that um, I believe he has found that GTO. So, uh, the GTO he, solution. He, oh, wow. The GTO yeah. solution to Warcraft. What, he, do, do you have any insights in what the GTO solution to Warcraft 3 looks like? Well, I guess he has developed his strategy to, to an extent that it cannot be improved further. So, and by, uh, by saying that, uh, I feel that that's the GTO uh, of Warcraft 3 game. Nice. Did he already play when you were playing? Because I assume it, as you said, right, it takes a lot of time. So in order to reach the GTO solution in any game and play it almost perfectly, yeah. You, you, yeah. Need, you need to put in a lot of hours. Yeah, Happy started his career maybe, I don't know, four years after I started. And okay. we were able to play against each other. And yeah, I guess uh, I won even a couple of matches against him. <laughs> Oh, wow, uh, that, that, that is something to be proud of. Now you can say, oh, that happy yeah. guy, yeah, it's the GTO. No, no, I beat him a couple of times. I beat him a couple of times. For, for some reason, he he was pretty good uh, from the beginning of his career. So Some reason, uh, I, some reason. Yeah, I don't know what yeah. it was, but yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe he was using an RTA on the side. Hey, you never know. Yeah. You never uh, know. In, that was... Uh, before you mentioned that around it was around 2009, you mentioned that you started to see poker becoming more popular on uh, Russian TV and you thought the game was super cool. Many of our previous guests mentioned seeing high stakes poker, the, you know, the big piles of cash on the table, all the cool characters like Ivy, Dwan, Semi Farha. They really inspired them to become a professional poker player. Did one of these guys you saw on TV inspire you? to become a poker player? And was there someone considered famous in the Russian community back then that you could look up to? Huh. That's, a, that's a very tough question to answer because that um, event happened, that event of me watching a poker show on Russian TV channels was uh, almost 13 years ago. So I do not recall any names that were playing. Um, in those games. Um, one name that comes to my mind is the name of um, uh, the second place finisher of 2008 uh, WSOP main event. Um, so the guy's I, I, name is- I would not know. Yeah, so the guy's name is Ivan Demidov and okay. he's from Russia. 
And guess what? Uh, he's a former Warcraft 3 player as well. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So, so uh, were you aware of that back then in like 2009 that like this guy went from Warcraft to the World Series, finished second, probably won a couple of million? Um, for some reason, when I started my career, I did not know about that, uh, that happening. Uh, however, maybe half an hour, oh, sorry, half a year later, um, I realized that uh, the guy um, who was a former Warcraft 3 player managed to, to get second in the, in the main event. So yeah, just, just a coincidence. You, you also mentioned that what actually really, really put you over the line to, to start playing online poker was that a friend of yours who also played Warcraft 3, wow, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of talented Warcraft 3 players transitioned into poker, uh, that he won the same amount that you earn by working a month. He won that in just one night. So that was yeah. something that really put you over the edge. Just like, oh, wow, this is possible with an online game. I've been playing Warcraft 3 for over eight years, have not really made, managed to make any money out of it, but you can just make my salary in one night. Yeah. Um, I remember that uh, number, $1,000. And that was precisely how much he had uh, at his account at that time. So he made um, a post in his social network uh, showing that, uh, um, showing the screenshot of his cashier. And that really inspired me. I started to, um, to get, uh, started doing some research on um, how to get into poker, what are the ways of um, uh, starting to play the game and, yeah, um, roughly in summer 2009, I uh, managed to get my free bankroll from one of the poker sites. And yeah, basically in September, I started playing. Yeah, I, I can imagine that, you know, it's often good if you see someone do it and actually succeed especially i think when they have the same background as you so this guy winning the world series your friend did this encourage you like oh wow they are basically just like me they can do it so i can do it as well did that give you a lot of confidence um i would not say it was about confidence it was about um giving it a try so uh I thought uh, I saw real people starting to make money with poker, and yeah, as you mentioned, they were not no different from me. And yeah, that's well. I guess that that's uh, another way of um, uh, giving confidence, right? So uh, yeah, I definitely had more confidence uh, seeing the results of my friend than before. Yeah, it's like uh, if they can do it, why why I can do it? Especially if you already kicked their ass in Warcraft. It's like, hey, you you can do this poker thing, then I can probably do this poker thing as well. You did. What were like your expectations going into play poker? Because he won your salary in one night. It's like, okay, he won a thousand dollar in one night. Well, there's thirty around thirty nights in a month, so I'll make thirty k <laughs> a month. What, what what's that kind of how the math? Like, I can imagine if you don't know know anything about poker, that's kind of how the math goes in your head. Um, initially, there were no expectations uh, about the amount of money that um, it was possible to win. Um, so I just wanted to try something new. Uh, remember, I stopped playing Warcraft. And at that point, I had quite a bit of free time left uh, for myself. And I was uh, searching for some some hobby and uh, poker um, was, I guess, the number one choice of finding that new hobby. Yeah, it has the similarities with Warcraft, right? You like something to put your mind to. It's a difficult puzzle. You're being challenged. You, you mentioned that you would do some research in terms of how to start playing poker. Any, any research that you remember, like some basic strategies that you started out with? Well, I remember that um, 
uh, poker site that uh, that gave me um, basically free bankroll, and they um, provided some studying materials as well. So initially, I studied by um, basically studying those uh, materials on that website. Yeah, and that that worked. That worked pretty well. <laughs> So you immediately, due to implementing these strategies, you immediately notice, okay, there's quite a lot of skill in the game. Mm, I did not think like that uh, at that moment. Um, I actually thought that uh, considering how simple the strategies were, everyone could have implemented them and start winning in poker. And yeah, it was, well, the strategies were yeah, as I mentioned, pretty simple and they worked. They worked. So, uh, yeah. So the strategies were pretty simple, but it still intrigued you because from what I'm hearing from you, you like a bit more the complexity uh, that, for example, that was one of the drivers in Warcraft 3. Did then poker, after you the kind of discovered a strategy to win, was it like, oh, this is not that hard. Did, did it kind of then lose interest for you? Or what then kept you going except for the for the complexity? Obviously, um, it's way more complex, we, uh -huh. we know now. But maybe I yeah. guess back then, yeah. it's like, okay, the goal is to win money. I, I now make money. Um, there were quite uh, a lot of studying materials at the website that uh, I mentioned. Um, so uh, once you... Um, go up in stakes, you had more and more access to, to the new materials. So uh, the force that was driving me was to, to learn something new and new uh, every single day. And yeah, so basically that website kept me busy for maybe um, half of a year or so, or maybe one year. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can understand. It's like kind of the gamification, right? It's like, oh, I want to unlock. I want to I wanna go move up one level so I can unlock the new knowledge. Um, yeah, and another thing was that as, you, as I moved uh, up in stakes, uh, the simpler strategies stopped, stopped working. So I had to upgrade those strategies in order to be able to uh, to win money at the next stake level. And is it, I mean, even maybe even up until today, is it that every time, you know, you can level up one more, there's new challenge. Is it something that intrigued you and keeps on driving you forward even up until today? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's been, it's been pretty boring for me to say, uh, to stay at uh, the same level. So I've always, uh, wanted to move to the next level. And I know some people are, mm, are playing um, the same limits uh, every single year of their career. Uh, and um, I'm just not like that. I, I need uh, more and more sophisticated challenges to basically to compete in and it, it feels that's just a part of my personality no i can definitely uh i can definitely relate i think confidence in your ability that you can actually do it and that even if right now you can't that you can learn the skills in order to beat the next level i think that's a very important thing i think a lot of players they just stay stuck in their stake in their comfort zone because deep down inside they are maybe a bit afraid that if they would move up one stake, that they would get confronted, that they might not be good enough. And that's a certain amount of uncomfort that they're not willing to go through. So therefore they just stick within their comfort zone. They will make excuses like, ah, oh, yeah, but I'm making good money here. I can pay my rent, stuff like that. Um, so I think, do you, do you think that the success that you had in Warcraft 3 helped you develop that mentality, right? Having success early, seeing that you can make progress, seeing that you can beat other people. Did that help you develop that confidence? Or do you think that's something that's just installed inside of you even before Warcraft? 
maybe beating your dad in chess? Yeah, you're asking very good questions. Um, I'm not sure exactly. Um, maybe that, uh, that part of me was present even before Warcraft. Um, what I can say for sure is Warcraft helped me to develop it. Mm -hmm. So maybe if uh, I did not play Warcraft 3, I would not have been able to uh, achieve as much in poker. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it has helped. Uh, it has helped in, in many ways, as we already uh, kind of talked about. Adam, I know that you played Heads of Cynic Ghost, and there's also clear, uh, like a clear ranking system, right? You can always look up to the next level. And I know there's like a little mafia going on. There's a bunch of guys who kind of control the gates of the next Heads of Cynic Ghost levels. You kind of knock on their door, have to battle them, and then at some point they're like, okay. You're welcome at this stake. We kind of sh share the fish. It's a it's a whole community. Did this every time looking up to the next stake? Did, did, was this also a big driver for you? Hundred percent. Yeah, the heads up sitting go kind of games are very structured towards getting to the next level and having to battle your way into that next level. So the same way a computer game, you try to level up, be the end boss, and go to the next level. The heads of sitting go lobbies are kind of structured. So uh, when you get good enough, you start to shot take the level above and keep progressing. So uh, yeah, the first four or five years of my career were like a computer game of trying to get good enough to be the next level. And then you go for a period where you play the best regulars at the level above, you get the seal of approval, well done, you're good enough. And then you can kind of start to share the kind of fish traffic that goes through that level. So yeah, very, very addictive. And also uh, it's a lot of growth goes into that because you can either decide, I think a lot of players very quickly decide, oh, wait a second, I'm just stick at mid stakes because I don't want to keep progressing because every time you want to progress, you've got to really go into a vulnerable position where basically you're going to play tough opponents. You're going to probably lose money slash break even for a number of months in order to crack that next level. And that's uh, some players just don't want to sign up for that. Other players just like, right, next level, next level. So uh, I think it depends on your mindset if that's a good fit for you. Something like MTTs would never have that kind of structure. You can play, if you're the bankroll, you can play any sort of stakes and there's still enough fish traffic going through where you don't have to necessarily battle them. Uh, but yeah, I think it's an interesting characteristic of certain formats. And it definitely, uh, it definitely feels like a kind of computer game where you're trying to get to the next level, which is super interesting. So yeah, I want to jump into the storyline. Basically, it took you uh, about seven years to get to high stakes and you started back in 2009. And you mentioned that you've probably gone through everything an online poker player could face. And that I'm going to assume that from 2009 to 2016, it didn't go in a straight line and just all the way to the top. So what are some of the things that you struggled with being a professional poker player, especially in the early years, maybe the first two or three years? What are some of the things that were difficult for you? Well, first of all, I have to mention that um, I started from a different discipline that I play now. So while now I play uh, uh, cash games, um, 100 big blinds and up, uh, initially I played cap games, which have which which had like 20 big blinds uh, buy-in. So uh, the first, I believe, three years. Uh, I dedicated uh, towards playing cap games and I reached the highest stakes in cap games. And then for some reason, I became bored. So uh, what I decided to do is to mm, restart my career. And I moved down to uh, 50 NL in order to learn that uh, um, real cash game poker. So uh, yeah, speaking of struggles, I guess, I guess the main struggle that I've had during those years was my desire to play more and more. So uh, instead of uh, quitting the session when, um, when my conditions were um, far from ideal, I kept playing and playing. And I would imagine that cost me a lot of money, both um, uh, in cap games and later in the like regular cash games. So yeah, it um, it takes quite a bit of discipline to um, to to leave the table, especially if the if the game is very good. So uh, um, it's it's definitely a mental leak that I had at that time, like um, a mental game leak. And yeah, I can say that I've been working on it um, yeah, for the last 
I don't know, 10 to 12 years, and I'm still working on it. So how have you been able to make progress with that? Let's say it sounds like you're somebody who uh, just wants to play a lot, and this can lead you to play it suboptimal and play it too long in certain periods. So for you, like, is there any sort of limitations you create for yourself? Do you check in with yourself to go, right, right now I'm feeling a bit burnt out, a bit tired? Is there any kind of safety nets or boundaries you uh, put in place for yourself to stop yourself playing too much? Um, well, I guess uh, the most important thing that I did was uh, journaling. So after every single session I played, I put a grade at how, how I felt about my game in that session. Maybe in, um, in one, one month's time, I had this, basically I had grades for every single session that I played throughout the months. And you know, during the months, you can have uh, as many as maybe 40 sessions played. Mm -hmm. So that's quite, uh, quite a significant sample size. And by uh, analyzing that data, you can deduce uh, how the session length impacts the, your, uh, the quality of your, of your game. And then I realized that um, at some point, my game becomes so bad that I'm no longer profitable, even at the best tables that I play. So uh, yeah, I found that sweet spot in terms of uh, the session length that uh, I do not need to cross uh, in order to stay profitable. And mm -hmm. yeah, since then, it became only a matter of uh, being disciplined enough to quit the tables once that uh, time has passed. I love this. As a performance coach, this really lights me up, this topic. And yeah, it sounds like what happened there was you basically brought some awareness to what was happening and you used that via tracking. So every session you would grade your performance and it became very obvious quantitatively with numbers that certain session lengths were almost like diminished returns and they would go negative. And then once you saw that, I think poker players are very good once they see data on something, they respond to that data. When there's no data, it's like, oh, don't play as long. It's very kind of fluffy. But when you get numbers on it, you can see over 40 sessions a month that your five longer sessions were also your lowest graded sessions. You start to go, wait a second, these long sessions aren't doing me much good. So now you've got the data to back it up. And like I said, then it becomes a discipline. Can I stick to a, a certain a session length that is optimal for me, an optimal strategy in terms of session length? And like, yeah, I'm sure you face that that itch to want to play. I know players who have this, the same kind of problem that you're having, they just want to play it. It comes from a really nice place, but at the same time, that desire to want to play sometimes, yeah, leads you to play at times when you shouldn't. So yeah, I think of that data is really powerful. So anyone who's watching this, who's overplaying, do exactly what Sergi said there. And yeah, basically track your grade, your performance for your sessions and see with data where your sessions drop off and there'll be a yeah, diminished returns point for session length where you want to be aware of. I want to quickly touch on you transition in formats. So it sounds like you basically got to the highest stakes and cap in the first two or three years, and then you transitioned to real cash games and yeah. you almost started again from like 50 NL. So from a mindset perspective, that's very interesting because you've built up a skill set and you've become very good at a format. And even though you might see more opportunities in regular cash games, it's very hard to go back to being a kind of more low stakes player and to learn that format again. So for you, did you find any challenges taking on a new format, having to drop levels? Was there any, any, any conflict you had to overcome to uh, transition to a, a lower stake? It was quite tough uh, in the beginning uh, because, um, well, I knew a lot about cap games and I had uh, those um, well, ideas and strategies memorized and transitioning to uh, 100 big blinds poker um, was, was not an easy thing to do. So I had to rewire my brain to some extent because some of the concepts from the cap games were not working apparently. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, the, best, the best thing that worked for me was uh, finding uh, poker fellows that played um, the same stakes that, that I did at that time. And we started um, our studying journey together. So that, that, quilt, uh, that helped uh, quite a bit during that time. Yeah, awesome. So for you, uh, 
progressing from low stakes to mid stakes, I find for a lot of players is one of the biggest jumps in poker. So for you, what were some of the things that you changed either on or off the tables that allowed you to transition like from the lower stakes to the mid stakes, especially at the regular cash games? So you mentioned you've got other players who you're studying with. What were some of the other changes that you had to make on and off the tables to, uh, to, to get to mid stakes? How and by mid stakes? So uh, what stakes do you mean? Let's call it 100 NL to 500 NL. Uh, okay. Um, hmm. Well, I guess it was just uh, a matter of um, sufficient bankroll. So uh, when I started playing 50 NL, I had uh, $1,500 in my cashier. And then uh, I guess I moved uh, to next stakes when I had 30 buy-ins of the, of the new limits. So uh, uh, speaking of um, what helped me to transition, I guess I, I've learned a lot from uh, watching Watts. Um, Oh, probably at that time I, I had hired my first coach and he actually did not help me initially because he, mm, his studying approach was uh, quite different from everyone else's. Uh, does the name Matthew Janda tell you anything? Yes. So uh, in fact, he was my, uh, our first um, uh, theory coach. And you know, it was a pre-solver era. So no one really knew what GTO was at that time. And Janda had his own perspective on how GTO should look like. And uh, in retrospect, I can say that uh, uh, his, his view was uh, quite a bit off. So, uh, I basically started learning wrong theory. Well, not wrong theory, but um, the theory that was a little bit off. And while other players were learning by, uh, I guess, watching video on demand or uh, uh, trial and error approach, I, I was learning mathematical concepts. So uh, uh, that were a little bit off. So that's, that was definitely a struggle. Um, and once uh, Janda started to uh, tweak his uh, uh, well, strategy and uh, studying approach, um, things started to make more and more sense. And I guess uh, that's what uh, helped me at that time to uh, to progress, to move from uh, 100 to an hour to like uh, mistakes. Yeah. What was it that made you seek a coach at that stage? Were you struggling with strategy? Was there a lot of unanswered questions? What, why did you feel like at that time period you reached out to seek a coach? Uh, do you remember I talked to you, uh, told you about that uh, uh, poker studying website mm -hmm. that gave me the free bankroll? So at some point, um, I really... Uh, stopped liking their approach because they were presenting some information without uh, really uh, explaining it. So I had to take those facts for granted and apply them without understanding why I have to play like uh, uh, the article dictates me to play. So, uh, and I started for uh, uh, doing research of the coaching market. And yeah, I wanted something um, maybe unique that uh, other players did not uh, uh, use at the time. And that's why I uh, talked to Matthew. And uh, yeah, that started uh, our cooperation. It seems like there's an element of curiosity there built in for you. And you started to see that the strategy you were using told you what to do, the what behind the strategy, but not necessarily the why. And you wanted to go deeper and find more advanced strategies. 
that led you to seek coaches that maybe knew things that you didn't know. I find it interesting that the coaching experience to begin with didn't work out very well because the strategy wasn't exactly a good fit for you at that time, but you stuck with it and the strategy evolved. I think sometimes when we're trying to learn, it doesn't go in a kind of ABC manner. We have to take on more information. Sometimes things get confusing for a while. We'll misapply things. We'll learn things in the wrong way, but it's all part of that learning process. And you've got to almost like put yourself out there and basically take on new information, new perspectives in order to come to your own kind of conclusions. So for you, uh, when you had a coach at this period, were you kind of following the coach's lead in terms of strategy? And when did you start to develop your own strategy or sort of think for yourself outside the coaching environment? Um, yeah, I definitely was uh, following his uh, ideas, well, at least initially. And um yeah, I found myself in situations that uh, basically did not did not align with the ideas that uh, the coach was presenting, and I was starting to uh, to realize that uh, the strategy and the theory that Matthew was uh, coaching me. Um, was probably not not the best strategy that uh, works uh, worked at the worked in the environment that I was playing. So, and that's why I feel that cooperation with other fellow poker players helped me a lot because we were able to um, discuss how how let's say uh, a given situation is played. In the real poker on the real poker table not in theory and um, yeah we basically had three opinions and uh, it's easier to come to to a good conclusion once you have three opinions and not just once not just one yeah so it sounds like a very good peer group who are playing the same games as you where you could take the kind of theory you are learning and you could run it through your kind of peer group of is this working in practice? What are you guys seeing? This is what I'm seeing. What's happening in this in real life practice of these games? I think it's always a very important step where when you're learning theory, you've got to think, how does that theory apply to the exact games I'm playing? So yeah, I think it's really good that you've got other players who you could do that with. And for you, do you feel like you've been quite a self-directed learner throughout your career? So you've talked about seeking a coach, we talked about your peer group. Do you feel like you were always looking for more information, trying to find a, a different peer group or more information to access? Have you always been directing your own learning in that way? Um, yeah, I feel it was always not enough for me. So apparently the, we know nowadays that poker is a very complicated game. And uh, it, it even started to feel that way uh, 10 years ago. So uh, yeah, I've always, I was always searching for new information. And while I was not trying to get into other um, studying groups, since I thought that um, our, well, three person group was, was enough for studying, um, I actively looked for um, getting information from the web. So uh, there were some um, uh, learning sites, like maybe you recall there was one site called Cardrunners, cardrunners.com or something like that. And yeah, some of the popular high stakes players at the time posted uh, videos there. And yeah, I was, I was amazed for instance, by uh, it was probably Sauce, Sauce one two three four, or Sauce one two three. I don't recall the name exactly. So yeah, some of the videos there were yeah fantastic, and they they really inspired me to uh, to keep keep going, to keep studying, to keep learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other than strategy that you were evolving with, did you run into any mindset leaks during that period? I know when you're going from like low stakes to mid stakes, very often the money starts becoming real. And all of a sudden you can actually do lots of stuff with the money that you're making, which wasn't the case in your career. And sometimes players like limit themselves when they start to see their cashiers going um, in the right direction. For you, was there anything that limited you in your kind of mid stakes in terms of any mental blocks you ran into or any leaks that you had to overcome? 
Um, yeah, I guess um, I can think of a couple of leaks that uh, that were at that time. Um, so, as I mentioned, I started learning theory. So, uh, and you know, the theory usually dictated certain ways to how to play uh, play certain spots, and I was so fixed with this uh, mindset of playing uh, playing the spots only in the one possible way that it was hard for me to um, to think freely and uh, maybe use uh, another line to play the spot uh, or to use like another bet sizing. So the theory was uh, so deeply um, ingrained in my brain that uh, it was pretty tough to to find that wisdom of um, like playing playing as uh, as you want. Um, yeah, you mentioned one thing about uh, money's uh, starting matter um, when you start playing uh, mid stakes. Well, I do not uh, recall my feelings at that time. Uh, I can say that the money in cashier has been, uh, well, simply the numbers for the um, significant part of my career. Uh, I tried to follow the bankroll management approach pretty well. And uh, by doing so, I was able to limit my losses and, uh, well, basically not to have that uh, mental leak of scared money, if you can say it like that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's something like that. The first thing you said about having the fixed theory strategy, I think a lot of players will be struggling with this right now on the GTO era, era where everyone's learning theory from solvers. It's sometimes a brave move to deviate strategy and sometimes it feels safer just to uh, be rigid, do what the solver does. And it takes like a lot of confidence in yourself to uh, go against what is kind of the, what the theory is saying. So you can freely apply your adaptive or exploitive strategies in game. And yeah, I think uh, it sounds like you were struggling at one stage of your career to allow yourself to express yourself, to uh, make creative players and you are sticking a bit too rigidly to the theory. So yeah, I'm sure a lot of players watching might be going through that same ball right now. So for you, when you were transitioning out of that and allowing yourself to uh, have a more adaptive strategy, how did you approach that? How did you allow yourself not to uh, be so fixed to the theory? Well, uh, to be honest, I am uh, still a little bit uh, fixed in terms of how I play. So, um, but I've, I've made some progress throughout the years. So uh, I guess one of my main break breakthroughs uh, throughout my career was that uh, I realized that you can play against every single opponent differently that is on your table. Not play your strategy, but play, let's say, five different strategies against five opponents that are your are at your six max table. And uh, yeah, basically um, opening your mind for that idea really allowed me to uh, to experiment a lot with my game because whenever you try to exploit someone, you you are forced to go out of your comfort zone on play, of playing that fixed strategy. And you are obligated to play differently against uh, various types of opponents. Um, yeah, I guess that that's what helped me in that regards. Awesome, perfect. So Rene, you're anything but a fixed strategy kind of guy. If anything, you come from the extremes of exploits and you've had to put more theory into your game to kind of balance that. How do you think that's been different from your experience when you were playing mid stakes from a, a more free strategy and having to uh, learn fixed strategies later on? How was that different for you? I think the biggest trouble or struggle that players have who do, who didn't come from a theory background, I was pure exploitative. And then like, I think around 1K, 2K, I would always stagnate. <laughs> surprise, surprise. I needed, I needed to learn some theory. Uh, but obviously... I think this has been talked about quite often. 
like that you need to know, understand what is correct in order to identify what someone is doing wrong. So I thought people were doing something wrong that wasn't wrong. So I was making exploits on them that were actually not exploits. I was just exploiting myself. I think that's a quite a common struggle. And also, what do you do if you have no information? So I'm against someone who I don't know. I have no baseline because every strategy would be created on the fly versus how I think my opponent plays. But if I don't know anything, I'm like, I'm clueless. If my heart is not on, I'm like, I cannot play poker because your decision-making is all around that. I have no theoretical baseline. Uh, so also what would happen is you would suffer a lot in playing volume because every time you have to create a strategy from scratch in every spot that you get in. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that prevents you from playing a lot of volume because it's very mental fatiguing. So I think having a certain theory base to play from, right? That in generally is going to work. And then from there, indeed, exploit based on certain opponent tendencies. That is the way to go. That's what I found out uh, later on in my career. Uh, it was also interesting what Sergi mentioned in terms of the theory. And you also pointed it out that I think a lot of players now struggle with that with solvers. Uh, he struggled it with the theory that Matthew Genda taught him, but people now often struggle with solvers that they're trying to, they're, they're being taught what to do without understanding it. But I think the main thing that I always teach students is that they have to start to think in terms of what are you trying to achieve with your hand? Okay, the theory is there because it achieves a certain thing. You have to understand what it's trying to achieve. And then you have to go into the table that you're playing against. And as Sergio pointed out, they play differently. So we have our default strategy, which usually achieves what we want it to achieve. Uh, it generates the most EV. But versus other players, we might achieve the same thing by taking a different line. When you started, I, I assume, that, do you relate with this, Sergio, what, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I've had um, multiple poker fellows throughout my mm -hmm. career that I worked with, and uh, that's that was as, as especially uh, obvious in the earlier parts of my career when people just were doing things like betting, checking, raising, blah blah blah, uh, without realizing what they wanted to accomplish, as you mentioned, Rene. Um, so they were just doing that for some reason. And I guess the most uh, common reason at that point was that the guy in the video did the same and it worked. That's why I will try to do, to do it myself. Uh, so yeah, I guess digging deep in the uh, reasons for, for every single action that you take uh, at the poker table is, uh, is the way to go nowadays. How did your enjoyment in playing poker change after you kind of break free from that theory and kind of were like, oh, my mind is now opened up for all these possibilities. How did your enjoyment for the game change after that? I guess uh, there are or there have been three periods in my poker career in terms of how they related to enjoyment. So there was this first period when I uh, just started learning theory and had this fixed mindset. Then I had uh, uh, the second period where I started um, thinking more openly. So apparently I had more enjoyment because I was not uh, constrained with the actions that I had to make. And it feels that nowadays I am uh, a little bit fixed uh, again because people started playing fixed strategies um, for the most part. So, and I guess the, the best way to beat them is to play like a solid strategy yourself. So unfortunately nowadays, uh, there is not much uh, room for maneuvering uh, at the high stakes. So, and it sounds a little bit sad. So I would rather um, go back, let's say, five years ago and play play there rather than play in the current environment. Yeah, I, I feel you there. It's, it's just so much nicer when people deviate because then if you... It feels a little bit more if you make a good exploit and you created a good strategy that plays into its weakness... It, it, you really feel like you deserved it, right? Whereas if you just try to play, you know, your solid strategy, plays his solid strategy, in the end, we'll see who wins. 
it's more like, yeah, okay. Yes, obviously we had an impact on this, but it doesn't feel as good as really exploiting someone, right? Um, yeah, yeah, to, to a certain extent. Uh, you know, this uh, GTO strategies are sometimes quite boring when you are implementing them. So yeah, there is actually one name that uh, I can, can share that um, that you can have fun playing against nowadays. So okay. may I share that name? So, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, you know him. Uh, his name is Stefan. Mm -hmm. So that guy is everything but GTO. So he plays uh, very unor unorthodox style. He has very unorthodox um, sizings, ranges, uh, betting frequencies. So if you want to play the exploit game, go play against him. If you are good enough, then... You yeah, know, okay. So, but I like to play the exploit <laughs> game versus guys who I beat, right? The, because yeah. that's the nice feeling. Like the feeling I guess you have when you play against Stefan is you're just clueless what's going on. I remember it was an yeah. episode with Clenty we did where he also mentioned he played heads up against Stefan and he saw three button opening sizings and some of them included an immediate three times spot over bet on the flop. And he was like, okay and basically one out of ten hands would end up with stefan putting his stack in the middle and he was just like okay i have no clue what's going on here but I i'm this is too far out of my comfort zone i'm out <laughs> is, is that kind of the feeling you get like how do you defend yourself against something like that um i wish i knew the strategy how to defend myself <laughs> and i'm very surprised that Quanti mentioned that only one out of ten hands uh, ended up with uh, Stefan putting his stick in. He was in a passive day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I haven't, well, I actually have played Stefan heads up a little bit, maybe a couple of thousand hands. And yeah, it was precisely like that. Constant pressure, constant large sizes everywhere. And yeah, it, it's very tough. It's very tough. I'm pretty sure that you, it, it is beatable. Uh, however, you really need to have your homework done before the match in order to succeed. And yeah, even because if... you, you, you need to know what to expect and you need to prepare for that because else you would just be overwhelmed by what you're facing, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we are, we are all human beings and it's, it's mentally very tough to play uh, especially long sessions against Stefan because it's, he, he is in his comfort zone. You are not. So the longer you play, uh, the tougher it gets for you. What, what have you learned by playing against Stefan or observing Stefan play that you can add to your own game? You talked about like a little bit of the unpredictability and trying to maneuver people in a part of the tree that you know what's going on and they don't. Well, I guess... Uh... He does not have the word uh, restriction in his arsenal. So he can basically do whatever uh, comes to his mind. So uh, mm, I guess the main thing we can learn from him is how to be open about your strategy and not, um, not try to be uh, fixed with your like, uh, um, comfort zone lines, sizes, uh, sizes and frequencies. Yeah, I like I like the I like the question. Why not? People often, you know, they stay within a line, but yeah, why not do this? Why not? And then come up with if you can if you cannot come up with good enough reasons, why not? Maybe may, maybe try it. But it's easy to look at it now, right now that he's you know at the top. But I remember, and maybe you remember as well, playing against him in 2016, 17. Uh, just just com complete spew i mean you could argue that some things are still complete spew because like the line between spew and genius yeah it's it's quite a thin line so maybe there he was already very good back then i i just didn't understand it but i remember also in terms of his results he would move up move down it it, it wasn't very consistent and i think over the years he has kind of filtered i guess the, the most spewy part out and it became more to the line of genius but for people not to be mistaken that this is just, you know, how he's always been, right? 
Well, definitely um, he has not been like that throughout his career, like he is now. So uh, he has been experimenting a lot with, uh, with his strategy, with how, um, how his opponents play against him. And it feels that nowadays he has found his sweet spot. Um, and he has also found uh, ways to deviate. And uh, I'm pretty sure that he, uh, he adjusts to every single opponent he plays against. And I can't say that every regular that I play um, have that in their arsenal. So I guess being able to adjust um, against um, every other regular and every spot uh, you are in is, uh, is a very important skill that uh, the top players could have. Yeah. And that, that makes it also a bit more difficult because you can analyze Stefan, but if Stefan bases his game on your game, analyzing Stefan, obviously it will help you into a degree. It's probably better to analyze yourself than go into the head of Stefan and think about if I was Stefan, how would I play this his style against me? But I mean, now, now we're at, a, yeah, we're, we're getting at a quite a difficult level. Let me ask you one question. Um, how many times do you think I analyzed Stefan's game throughout my career. How many times? Uh, I don't know. Uh, 30 times? Uh, n- not quite as many. Just five times. Uh, I mean, and... I, I just went for a high number because the way you framed yeah. the question. Still yeah, five times yeah. is, uh, is quite a lot. Well, I have not analyzed anyone else uh, that many times. So, and guess what happened? Uh, He's still like a level or a couple of levels ahead of me. Well, that's my uh, uh, that's my feel. And I guess things also changed the second time you analyzed the third time. Then, hey, he changed it. What what what's happening? Yeah. So uh, it basically happened the following way. Uh, I played against him, and then he disappeared for for a certain period, and then he came back with a different strategy. And I had no idea uh, how to deal with that, and I had to analyze him once again. And then he disappeared again. But this is this is this is so cool about poker. Once you open up your mind, right? Because there's many strategic approaches that you can take. If you if you play around in a solver and you give it a certain parameter, it will still come up with a solid strategy for that parameters. So what you could basically do is one week you will play this strategy. For example, you play in position as an issue raiser. Let's say. One week you play over bet check and the other week you play one third only. <laughs> I mean, if I did play against you, it's like, okay, yeah, which the wacko will show up? Sergi's like, yeah, I have no clue. He always comes up with this over bets. Oh, he now throws out the one third. Huh? What, what does this mean? Is that on the board? No, it's just random based on the week. Let's say you have four game plans for every week of the month. Yeah. That's what we know. I, I'm, I'm just being <laughs> open minded here. I'm just being open minded yeah. here. That, that would be quite tough to play against. You you mentioned that uh, teaming up with other players has had a big impact on your career. Uh, I love the quote, the bigger the dream, the more important the team, which basically incentivizes that you should probably work together if you want to try to reach the top. Do you still remember like a moment where it really clicked for you? You mentioned you transitioned away from metrogenous theory this was probably also because you started to work together with these other players that were in the same environment as you do you still remember something that really clicked for you back then when you started together with these guys well i guess uh, we started basically sharing our opinions uh, on the on the spot we are uh, discussing and those were not the opinions based on theory. They were the opinions based on the, the experience that uh, each of us had at the tables. So, uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, um, having those three opinions, if they all uh, sounded the same, then uh, it's pretty likely that they, they, they were correct. And if, uh, let's say, one of us had uh, a different perspective on how to play that spot. That's where we 
started uh, digging deep in the dyna dynamics of that spot in order to to find the real truth about how uh, how the spot should be played. How did uh... A strategy session between the three of you look like did you guys actually like study a specific topic together would you just go over hands how would that go um we we did not this was pre-solver age right yeah yeah definitely um so basically every one of us prepared um, um a certain number of hands for the session and we discussed them um, and afterwards, if we had some um, conflicting ideas, we worked on our own in order to, uh, to figure out uh, which, uh, which point of view was correct. Uh, for example, let's say you have a situation where you uh, face an overbet on the river in a certain spot. Let's say a person bets flop, that turn and overbet river and uh, you have conflicting opinions on this uh, situation. And then you can, what you can do is you can go uh, analyze your database, filter out for all uh, similar spots and get uh, a sample size. Mm, and it, let's say you see that five of the 10 over bets that you faced and uh, that went to showdown showed that a uh, person was bluffing. Then uh, it is pretty likely that this spot uh, is bluffable from your opponents. And on the contrary, let's say that only one out of 10 um, uh, situations show the bluff. Then it's pretty likely then uh, that this spot is under bluffed. And now take into consideration that you have uh, three people in that uh, in that group that means that you have three times as much sample size on, on those uh, spots uh, well basically to do some research on yeah so basically what you're saying is you guys have an opinion or an intuition and you're using data to confirm or deny this intuition to kind of get a, a more accurate intuition of what the pool is actually doing, right? That's not biased based on only your view because you're doing it with three others and not on three others view because you're double checking it with data. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's like with uh, grading your sessions uh, once they are completed as Adam mentioned. Uh, it's a pretty good thing for your brain to see the real data that shows you that if you play five hours long, five, five, five hour long sessions, it is bad for your results. It's an objective data. You can't uh, deny it. So uh, yeah, and same applies for uh, analyzing uh, hand history. By yeah, and especially now, nowadays, right? The, the whole coaching and stables around working with data and constructing strategies around data has become quite popular mainly for these reasons right yeah data doesn't doesn't really lie and obviously sometimes there's an exception but i think if you then allow yourself to always look for the exceptions your bias will then show and you will find more exceptions than are actually present uh, that's kind of the the downside of it you also mentioned that you loved to watch videos, Card Runner CV. I was a big Card Runner CV as well. So remember, what was the guy? Raptor with his Raptor bets. He was quite right about that. He would always three bet in position. He said, oh, I just three bet in position, but I think it was like ridiculous, 25% or something, because six three suited, for example, was in there. So we're, we're reaching quite high percentages. And then he would follow it up with a Raptor bet. He said, which was just like a 20% potsy bet or something. So strategically approved nowadays. So that was definitely something that uh, uh, that lasted. You mentioned sauce. Were there, was there, do you still remember some of the aha moments you got from watching some of these videos? And how did the way you approach poker after studying with these guys, watching this video change? How, how did you think different through hands after uh, accumulating this information? Well, I guess um, one of the aha moments. Hmm. Let me think for, for a bit. 
Uh, do you remember the concept of one minus alpha? Mm -hmm. So um, for our viewers who do not uh, know that, it's uh, the minimum defense frequency. So uh, let's say, yeah, I'll describe it uh, real quick. So let's say you face uh, a pot size bat on the river and uh, your opponent's range uh, consists of um, um, nuts and air, nuts and bluffs, and your range consists of blocking blockagers. So in order to make your opponent's blasts indifferent, you have to uh, defend 50% uh, of your range if you're facing a pot bat. So uh, this idea of the minimum defense frequency was uh, initially extrapolated to earlier streets to turn, flop, and even pre-flop. And as we know nowadays, uh, it's not true on the flop. It is especially not true if the ranges are mm, very asymmetric, asymmetrical. If one range has a significant advantage over other, uh, the defense, the optimal defense frequency is way uh, lower than this minimum defense frequency. And so speaking of the aha moments that um, I found in source videos, um, remember I was uh, um, studying uh, theory with Matthew Janda. Yeah, he, he and, was very much about that why, uh, one yeah. minus alpha stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I took uh, the ranges and I always, tried to, found, to find that uh, uh, borderline hand to defend. And as you might imagine, uh, it is usually quite a weak hand in your range, a weak and a very not obvious hand. So uh, I, did not, uh, I did not recognize those plays in source, sources videos. And in fact, he was uh, folding um, a little bit more than I was folding um, during that time. And I guess the fact that you, that you do not have to defend those weak hands uh, was, um, well, if not a break, breakthrough, but definitely uh, a huge boost in terms of uh, my win rate and uh, in terms of the confidence in my game, because I was doing those marginal plays on earlier streets and they never really worked. And by simply eliminating them, I started to get more enjoyment and more, more confidence in the place, in, in my overall strategy that I was implementing at that time. Yeah, I'm going to quote you there. You said, have to, I have to do this. That kind of you, you were in this phase of your career, you're kind of breaking free from the, I don't have to do anything. Okay, I can just do what I have to go to, to go back to the Stefan the Stefan era right now. I just do whatever I want and you deal with it, right? That's kind of the 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 uh, the um, yeah, sort of the new approach. I was never theory oriented, mathematically oriented. So I would always just be like, it's, it's it was very feeling based. Like, listen, I just don't see good things happening with this hand in this situation. That's more how I would then approach it. And probably when you were playing, like you probably also had that feeling, right? Because you, as you said, it never worked out with those hands. But there was kind of a conflict between what your gut was telling you and what your brain was telling you. Like, ah, but I have to. But your gut was saying, yeah, but this isn't working. So I, I guess you felt really relieved after that. Especially, yeah. again, if you have someone like Sauce showing you like, oh, wow, Sauce, he's a very good player. And he doesn't even do this. Fuck this. I'm free now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And Adam asked about... Um, mental leaks that I had earlier in my career. And yeah, you know, this rivalry uh, between having to do something that uh, the, the theory dictated and uh, that uh, action not really working. Yeah, that was very huge at uh, earlier stages of my career. And that worried me quite a bit because I thought that I was not uh, understanding something. I was not uh, uh, doing stuff right. 
And yeah, I even thought that, yeah, maybe the theory was not that good. Even at that time, I uh, yeah had those mm, insights in my mind. While you, the truth was actually that you very much understood it, only you were listening to your brain and not to your gut, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we around this time you're playing, I think, mid stakes. You mentioned that it was around 2016, I believe, when you reached 2K. Was this then breaking free? Was that enough to reach 2K for you? Um, I guess at that time I, I, I was still playing a more or less, uh, the fixed game, but, uh, it, it was, it was a way more, uh, free, free strategy than, uh, than originally. So, uh, um, I gave myself uh I gave myself opportunities to deviate and yeah it, it felt like uh like a relief mm. one another thing that uh, helped me a lot with uh establishing myself at uh, 2k was when i analyzed um uh, the database of uh OTB Red Baron, if you remember that guy. Uh, like like many have done before you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I I've seen how how freely he played, uh, how how much he deviated from uh, the the optimal game, and uh, that that gave me you know this this permission myself to not to play a fixed game, not to play the strategy uh, that is uh, uh, very fixed and not allow allowing for a, any creativity. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, OTB will always be in my heart. OTB, uh, much love right there for, 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 yeah. for OTB. No, it was funny that, that you, you mentioned this also with Stefan because back then, I remember you had you had OTP and you had Linus, and Linus was way more fixed in terms of he, the the parameters that he allowed his strategy to be, to be constructed around. Whereas with OTP, you always had that effect. You had no clue what to expect. He could now throw out a 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 100, 200, 300. He would just do random things on the fly, and that made it that element of surprise made it way harder uh, harder to play against him than to Linus in the beginning. Uh, even though obviously they were both crushing the games, I, I feel. Uh, um, well, I do not remember exactly how uh, OTB played in terms of that uh, um, freedom. Uh, I do not re- recall about him using um, as many sizings as you mentioned. Maybe he did. I do not remember now. Uh, what's really. Um, what I can really think about was that he 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 modified uh, the ranges very well. He adjusted the ranges very well. So uh, uh, he was definitely the guy who had the answers why he puts a hand to a certain range, and uh, I I feel that. The difference between him and early Linus. Uh, Linus tried, maybe tried to uh, to play as Solver did at that time. Uh, however, OTB tried to make more sense with with every single uh, play that he made. Yeah, he was definitely thinking. He had more of the achieving mindset. Okay, what does this hand want to achieve? How can I accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish? and do that basically, right? Then this is also kind of the same way that I approach poker. You have a hand, you want to achieve something. uh, It wants to accomplish something and therefore a bet sizing rolls out or a check rolls out because you want to achieve something. And basically all hands in your range want to achieve a different thing by 
sometimes by checking, sometimes betting big, sometimes betting small. And in the end, a balanced strategy will sort of roll out because certain hands, for example, want to slow play, certain hands want to fast play. And I think O2B did that very well. And by thinking in terms of this way, you can kind of construct your ranges around, I, I usually call this being lucky more often, or at least perceived to be lucky more often, right? Because you're trying to build strategies around trying to not get yourself in reverse implied odds situation as often, but more in implied odds situations. For the people who don't know, basically you're you're getting luckier by design. And that was, I think, something that he was doing very well. And he was, I think, one of the one of the first ones implementing that very well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, that concept of uh, being lucky more often than your opponents. Uh, you're not the first person who um, told me about that idea. Uh, so I guess, uh, yeah, he was doing that. <laughs> um, so, and as time went on, more and more people started to implement that concept in, in their games. And more people started getting more lucky than there. Yeah, and, and then suddenly everyone was lucky, right? But someone has, <laughs> someone has to still remain unlucky. But then I guess you know some card distribution. If you if you become strong player against strong player, this was probably also the time that solvers came out, right? You reached to 2K in 2016. I think solvers came out 2015, 16. Yeah, yeah, probably at that at that time. Or le- allegedly, allegedly they say. The word of the street is that some people had a solver before that, like, for example, an OTB or Linus. Uh, private solvers I heard about. I remember Kanu showing in his course that he had mm-hmm. a private solver already back in the day. So I'm sure there were some people uh, already deep into solver land. You had already some experience uh, with studying theory and deeply with Metrogenda. You were already aware of like the threats it would have. I'm I'm making an assumption now here that at some point you started to work with a solver, like I think 99% of players. When starting to work out with a solver, has the experience you had with Metrogenda, did that help you prevent certain mistakes with a solver? Also, maybe your background, uh, you studied a master, a master's, to, you have a master's in mathematics. Did these things help you using a solver or implementing knowledge from a solver in a better way? Well, I guess uh, I had um, advantage, an advantage initially, because uh, I was familiar with a lot of uh, things conceptually that uh, the solver was uh, implementing. Uh, and for a lot of other players who started working with the solver without prior theory knowledge, um, they definitely were making um, quite a few mistakes. Uh, in fact, one of the um, uh, guys that I worked with um, before before we started uh, our cooperation, uh, he had been doing uh, he had been doing a single mistake uh, every single time um, when using solar. Uh, it was about well, you know, in solvers, you have to um, create a tree for a certain situation and then uh, run solver and allow um, the solution to be uh, calculated. So, uh, and I, I remember he added, let's say, uh, a sizing on the flop, a different sizing, and then immediately started recalculating the solution. So he added just one node and he did not even check all the turn and river actions that were created in this node. And that uh, that mistake skewed the result quite a bit. Yeah, so what you're referring to, let's say, for example, you only give the solver a small bet on turn and river, then he would always prefer a big bet or usually prefer a big bet on the flop or use a certain check strategy in order to raise because he cannot get money in, in the traditional way on later street because you capped him to bigger sizing. So therefore the output is screwed. Actually, it's funny. You can actually learn quite a lot from a solver by sort of handcuffing him in certain ways. Like, oh, you're not allowed to do this. Then what's your solution? And he sometimes comes up with very creative solutions that 
I found out like some concepts by accident just by screwing up my sim, basically. Yeah, I guess you have to be uh, very careful with interpreting the solver solver's results. So uh, first of all, you have to be confident in in the tree that you are um, that the solver is calculating. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, what what I'm trying to say is that uh, do not do not trust everything you see that uh, the solver uh, suggests you doing. So uh, think with your with your own uh, head and yeah, try to make sense of uh, whether the the result is correct or not. That's a that's a very good advice. Usually, I also ask uh, ask the guest on to have a good tip, but I think this is this is an excellent tip, uh, Adam. Solvers, Heads Up Sitting Goes World probably was in the same, yeah, probably came out around the same time, right? 2015, 2016. Were you still playing back then? And do you remember some blunders you made starting to use solvers? Yeah, I think solvers like 2015, 2016, before they started getting used. I was playing 1K Heads Up Sitting Goes at the time. And yeah, strategy started to deviate a lot. And basically, everyone started to realize we suck at this game. It was one of those like kind of reality moments where everyone thought they'd already solved it. We played 25 big blinds, poker heads up. Everyone thought, yeah, we've got this down to a T. And then basically, once solvers came out, everyone's like, whoa, actually, there's a lot that we're messing up from pre plot frequencies to bet size. And so, yeah, I think that, like, like it was talked about, when you get into solvers, it's very hard at first not to uh, give the solver too much credit. Almost be like, oh, well, the solver's doing this, therefore, I'm going to start doing this. Now, I can see lots of people were misapplying solvers by either setting their own game trees or they were just like using it out of context. Or yes, yeah, so I think it's very hard like when you start using solvers to realize, okay, this is one data point. This is how we play in this scenario. But the game tree I'm playing against these opponent types is different. How can I use this solve information to implement, to, to deviate my strategy? But where do I, how do I keep my current strategy? So it's like that deviation between what you know intuitively and what the solver is telling you. It's, it's a kind of merging point. So uh, I like what Serge has been saying throughout this conversation. He comes from a theoretical background and you've almost over your career have to give yourself permission to explore different avenues. So I'm guessing when solvers came out for yourself, it must've been quite a challenging point because now you've got, again, a kind of fixed model, no freedom, do what the solver says. And again, you've got to kind of interpret that and use it for your own benefits. Same as Sergi, I had other friends I live with. So I had two other guys playing the same games as me. So we would chat over how the solver was doing stuff and how what was useful and what was actually happening in real games that we're playing and where's the solver getting misapplied. I remember when the first the solvers came out, there was a year of, how do people misuse solvers? We had almost like a, a quiz over lunch every day. How are people misusing solvers? Because it was one of those real, those things where it was, everyone's jumping onto it without the right implications. And yeah, there's lots of mistakes getting made in that kind of time frame. So yeah, I think it's it's really good to understand like what what are, what's the solver trying to achieve? What can you learn from it? But also where can you deviate from that strategy? I think Serge has been a good example throughout his career of trying to find ways to uh, deviate and create freedom, even though you've got that theory background. So I wanted to talk about uh, what stakes have been the biggest challenge for you? So uh, you've moved up pretty much every stake in the game. Uh, what was the stake that you found the most challenging to break into? And how did you manage to break into that level? Um, I guess uh, 2K was the toughest uh, uh, stake to establish myself there. Um, I've tried maybe five times um, to... Uh, to start uh, playing against the 2K regulars. And so uh, while well, the first four times were, um, well, did not, um, did not work. Yeah, uh, on the fifth time, yeah, I managed to play uh, a session where I won around 10 binds. And since then I, I started playing 2K now regularly and uh, yeah, basically never looked back. What was different about that fifth time where you actually cracked it? I guess uh, I stopped paying off every single time <laughs> just because of the opponents being so aggro. Um, and yeah, I feel that I, I saved uh, quite a few stacks uh, during that session. And yeah, a little bit of positive variance helped me as well. 
That reminds me of, we had a guest, Tobias Dudwan, and he was having a similar problem breaking into the high stakes as well. And his kind of advice was play solid. And it's, it's when you're playing higher stakes, you often give your opponents a lot of credits for being very creative and you call them off because you're like, we must have bluffs here. And then over time, you're like, wait a second, he hasn't got bluffs everywhere. I can fold here. I don't need to pay them. And yeah, sometimes uh, having the confidence to play a solid strategy against very competent opponents takes a bit of time. So for you, it was about the fifth time you're like, wait a second, I'm, I'm not calling these guys off. I'm going to find folds. And yeah, it takes, it takes time to um, stick to your strategy in the face of aggression against tough opponents. So for yourself, you mentioned that you're, you identify yourself with being more of a gambler at heart rather than a person who likes to play things safe. Has that character trait, how has that character trait influenced your poker career, both in a positive and a negative way? Um, I guess uh, it helped me not to, to stick to the boundaries, to any boundaries. So it allowed me to, to want more and more from my poker career. And um, the reason I, I quit cap games was that at some point I became bored. And uh, so I do not see myself playing playing a boring game like uh, every single day, let's say for, for a year or so, or even for a couple of months. Uh, it, it, I just won't um, feel happy by doing that. So uh, yeah, being a gambler in heart allowed me to, uh, to want more and more. And I guess if I was a more, uh, if I was a calmer person, calmer person then I would have stopped maybe at 500 and now, maybe at 100 and now, who knows? And maybe we would not have been talking mm -hmm. uh, today. What have been some of the negative sides of being a gambler at heart? Because like you said, it allows you to take on more risk. You don't like being bored and stagnating. So you want to take on that next challenge. And yeah, like you said, a lot of players do get stuck because they uh, stop they stop seeking to progress. They're happy to make a good win rate and a good profit at a certain level. And they stop striving to earn more. For you, you don't have that problem. But has there, has there been any downsides of being someone who is a bit of a gambler or likes to take on risk? Has it caused you any problems throughout your career? Yeah, of course. Uh, and there have been quite a few uh, periods where mm, I didn't really enjoy the game. I didn't feel well because of that. And, you know, while taking more risk could be uh, positive in terms of uh, developing yourself as a player, it could also be very detrimental to your uh, bankroll. And um, I mentioned earlier today that sometimes it was tough for me to quit playing because I was so immersed in to the game and uh, yeah, some of the sessions I played did not end very well. Um, I remember myself losing 10 or even 20 buy-ins in a single session. And yeah, that's the, the opposite side of uh, being a gambler, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was there any experiences, you mentioned that losing 10, 20 buy-ins, was there any more experiences which like really uh, had a uh, profound effect on you. We had to almost go, wait a second, this is this is scary. I could go broke here and put myself at a lot of risk. Was there any, because you're someone who you say, you say would play a lot of volume and you might finish a session 10 hours, a bit of a blurry uh, last few few hours of that. Did you have any moments which were quite scary where you're like, wait a second, I put myself at too much risk right now with the, with the strategy I'm using? It did not feel that way when I was playing. However, afterwards, when I have a cool brain, then uh, I can, I was able to analyze what happened. Um, so uh, yeah, it was scary, definitely. Um, I remember once I lost roughly a quarter of my bankroll in, in one week. And yeah, I was very depressed at that moment. Um, it impacted a lot of uh, areas of my uh, ordinary life outside of poker. Uh, for example, I had, uh, um, I started having problems with my sleep. 
and that affected my uh, results even more because as we both would agree um, proper sleep is uh, is a key to being successful in poker and then like I guess in everything in our lives so uh, do not uh, do not play with your sleep mm. Yeah, I'm a big fan of sleep. I've been tracking mine for four years now with this Whoop Tracker, which gives me a daily recovery score. Same as you kind of grade in your sessions on a daily basis. This gives me a quantifiable sleep metric that I can use over time to uh, alter my behavior. I know if I've done certain things, that contributes to a low score for my sleep scores. And over time, I can basically create an optimal routine that allows me to get good recovery, good sleep, and good performance. Yeah, I think it's important for you to uh, acknowledge that you uh, generally are someone who likes to take on more risk. And I always feel like it's good to know yourself well enough so that you can balance out your kind of positive traits that can become negative. So if we look at being a gambler at heart, it's amazing if you want to play high stakes and especially the nosebleeds you play, but at the same time, it's going to put you in situations where you might take on too much risk, which might impact your bankroll, might impact your personal life. It might put a lot of stress on you so you can't sleep. So you've got to always be careful to kind of tread that line where, okay, I'm a gambler at heart, but I don't want to be a reckless gambler because like a lot of players get in trouble that way. You know, other people will be the opposite. They'll be very safety orientated and they need to gamble more. So it's almost like understanding where you are and trying to find that kind of balance point for your personality type. And unfortunately, we often have to learn the hard way. We often have to go too far one way before we get back into an alignment. And that's the growth of a human being, in all honesty. But yeah, it sounds like for you, you've been conscious of that. You've been mindful of it. And yeah, it's allowed you to uh, at least find that balance for you. Obviously, you're someone who takes on a lot more risk than the average person uh, just based on the, the level you play but at the same time you're not reckless with that and you found that kind of balance for you so you don't take on unnecessary risk which is good all right so uh, i want to talk about the russian community so uh, they're a bit of a hotbed for talents obviously it's a big country as well how are you guys as a community so we've, we spoke a little bit offline before we started how is the uh, russian community around each other so let's say uh, the high stakes community is there a big group of you guys who study together who share strategy um yeah how's, how do the high stakes russian community interact well, I can only speak for myself. Um, I guess there were two instances throughout my career where I worked with uh, two um, poker partners. And uh, nowadays I work only with one. So uh, I feel that for me uh, at the stage of my career where I am, it's, it's totally enough. Um, from what I've heard, there are... Um, well, groups of, I don't know, maybe three to four people who study together, but uh, these are just rumors. <laughs> I do not have any confirmation of that. Um, I know that um, there, are, there are a few poker players, the, the, top, the top guys uh, from Russia who have studied on their own throughout their career and uh, yeah, some of them started playing when uh, uh, at, at the same um, at the same time with me. Uh, unfortunately, I'm I feel that I'm not allowed to disclose their nicknames. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I would say that there are different ways of how um, players from pro Russian poker community approach studying. Yeah, some of them do that alone and uh, yeah some study in groups yeah so it sounds like it's most common to study in a small group maybe three four of you guys who will study together throughout your career we spoke with jose on our previous podcast he's from the spanish community it sounds very similar they have like in a small subgroups of maybe three or four of them who study together and they, they interact kind of loosely between their communities but yeah, they have a kind of small, small circles where you you know everything about each other and you you help each other with the career. And then there's other groups doing doing similar thing. But yeah, it's always interesting from the outside because I think the Russian community in particular is quite private compared to uh, like other communities. And I guess you guys obviously study together in your communities. You've got your own language, which is a barrier for any English people trying to study with high stakes Russian players. But yeah, it's interesting to know uh, the different approaches. And like you said, there's obviously some players who uh, just do it alone, do it by themselves, and they'll have equal success. So yeah, there's more than one path. To reach the top end yeah it's always good to uh, to learn about other communities all right so i want to ask a question so i'm going to reflect basically a bit on your career a little bit so what's one thing your poker career has taught you that you didn't expect um 
I guess the main takeaway is that uh, um, you do not have any limits in your life. So uh, I, I don't remember exactly which uh, guest shared this um, same idea that it's just a matter of uh, the hours that you put in that are required to succeed. Uh, Basically, in uh, every maybe every area of your life, so uh, it's not about talent. It's about uh, work ethic. It's about self-discipline, and it's about work-life balance that you have. So, if you have um, all the those point ticked, then uh, you could succeed basically in every area that you would like to. What a powerful lesson. And yeah, I think I love that. It's what you're saying there is basically we don't really have any limits. The limits are based on how much we can apply ourselves, how much effort we can put in, how much time and hours. And very often we create our own limits with our own narratives. We think we can get to a certain level, achieve a certain outcome in any endeavor. And we often limit that pursuit. And for you, for the poker pursuit, you've realized, wait a second, there aren't any really limits. Obviously, there's, there's certain physical limits. Like if I wanted to break the 100-meter world record, I'm probably going to run into some genetic um, uh, obstacles there. But most endeavors, especially when it comes to the mind and creating life circumstances, there are no limits. It's just what you can apply yourself to. Very often being around people. Actually, yeah, a question, a follow-up question on that. Is there anyone who is in your circle who you've been around who's helped you to think that way? Because myself, I was living with two other poker players and I was struggling to always keep progressing with like the next level. There was a few points where I wanted to kind of stop in my poker career, but the guys I was living with were always more ambitious than me. And they were always going, let's go to the next level. Let's do the next thing. So I, I would always like seek their, seek their ambition and go, right, I want to do the next thing. But for me, it was a bit counterintuitive at first, but I, over time I learned to adopt that philosophy and mindset. So for you, was there anyone around you, any role models uh, that's allowed you to uh, think without limits whilst you're progressing? Um, there is one guy uh, who I worked with uh, in my career. His nickname is Jacer1337 at Poker Stars. Um, he's not playing anymore, but uh, he used to be a very top regular at uh, the highest stakes on Poker Stars. So um, when we initially started working with him, I, I played 2K and 5K. And I thought at that point that that was enough for me. So I was making quite a bit of money there. And um, so I basically was trying to improve my strategy without uh, moving up in stakes. And at one of our earliest sessions, he showed me a couple of hands from uh, 10K and 20K. And we started analyzing them. And I realized that there were the same people playing, um, more or less. Uh, his reasoning behind the plays that his opponents made were, well, close to the reasoning that I had uh, at my regular stakes. And that was definitely a breakthrough for me. Um, seeing uh, my friend playing those limits and seeing that we were roughly at the same level at that point really made myself believe in that I could could achieve way more. I could start playing uh, those high stakes and uh, and I started. And I'm very grateful to uh, Jacer, whose name is Sergey as well. And yeah. Like, uh, like as OTB, he will be in my heart forever. It's interesting that we often cap ourselves at a certain level. So for you, 2K, 5K, it seemed like a point where you almost wanted to stop progressing and like optimize your win rate at that level. But it only takes like a little bit of a, an insight into the levels above, because often at that time you start to... Uh, glorify the levels above you put everyone on a pedestal and you're like all right these are amazing the 10ks 20ks must just be some gto gods i'm, I'm not going to go there but then you get like an insight into that level and go wait a second 
it's not that much different to the level I'm playing. And then you see someone who's in your circle actually playing those games and having success. And then all of a sudden the spark goes off and you're like, I can do it too. And that's somebody's all it needs that like that willingness to go, I can see that, that I could make it at that level. And then from there, obviously it takes a long time to uh, progress your game, build your bankroll, a lot of kind of skills you need to learn along the way. But that spark goes off and before you know it, you're trying to be a 10K player, 20K player, 100K NL player going forward. And yeah, you, you keep progressing. So yeah, really interesting. And I think it's awesome when you've got someone in your environment who can be that spark, whether it's a coach, a friend, or yeah, someone you're, you're around. All right. So what would yeah. you say uh, was the biggest contributor to your poker success? Very tough question, I know. Uh, but what separates you from, say, a player who gets stuck at the mid stakes, for example? A lot of players progress to a certain level and then they can't keep progressing. You've went all the way to nosebleeds, like uncomprehendable stakes for a lot of players. What do you think has been the biggest contributing factor towards that? Um, I feel that there is a lot more um, that determines poker success. Uh, apart from the poker strategy that you have. So uh, I feel that work-life balance is very important. Uh, your health, your nutrition, your uh, workout routine, um, your relationship with your family and friends. Uh, if you, if some of those areas are not, uh, are not well in your life, that will definitely have an impact on your overall poker performance. So uh, I feel that the best players in the world are the ones who, who have high levels in every aspect of their lives. So uh, I feel that that's, that should be what those uh, mid-stakes players should be striving for. Not only to create uh, an ideal, uh, non-beatable stra poker strategy, but also other adjacent parts of their lives. So happy you said that. Preaching to the choir here. Yeah, I think it's, it's such an overlooked avenue where players who are trying to succeed, let's say a mid-stakes player who's stuck, very often he's trying to double down on strategy. He's trying to find the next kind of quirky part of his game that he can improve on and he's neglecting all the work-life balance stuff his health's a mess his relationships are a mess um his nutrition's all over the place he's got a lot of stress in these environments and he just pushes that to one side because he wants to make money in poker and he thinks once he's achieved success he'll fix all those problems but what you're saying is basically you need to have these things in alignment all the way through and they actually feed into each other and i've had so many conversations with players who are like yeah but i don't know i haven't got time to work out i haven't got time to uh have good relationships. I'm just grinding all the time. I'm, I'm busy playing poker. Give me a break. And I always like try to like, say the same things you all say. And like, like, if you want to succeed in poker over the long term, these things are fundamental for you as a human to show up and perform at a high level. You need your life in order. Now that can be very different to certain people. Some people like to spend a lot of time with other people to kind of feel fulfilled and good. Others can just see their friends once a week, once every two weeks, and that's enough for them. So the kind of work-life balance isn't like a, a perfect metric game. It's more like understanding things that are important to you as a person and what makes you feel good and fulfilled and ticking those boxes over time, like having a, a kind of day routine, a week routine that allows you to feel good and perform well. Like I said, health, nutrition, relationships are three of the key ones that are going to implement that. And I think if we're talking about short samples, like say three months, six months, it doesn't matter as much because you can almost like get away with anything. You can just blast away and grind and study. But when we're talking like 12 years, like your career, all of a sudden these things matter a lot. It's almost like fueling yourself. It's almost like a Formula One car, taking pit stops and refueling. We need those as a human to keep going. So for you, uh, I really like that when the life lesson is to uh, be more holistic, uh, treat your performance overall in terms of the, the variables of your lifestyle are super important. And work-life balance is yeah kind of fundamental. It's funny. I always feel like players don't like that terminology, work-life balance. Every time I've done a video on that, it always fluffs like hell. Uh, so I need to find a different way of talking about the lifestyle balance that players need to succeed. Because uh, players are either for, all for it or all against it. So they're like, yeah, yeah, I want to live a balanced life. Or like, no, no, I want to work like crazy. Uh, but yeah, I really think it's an important avenue. And a lot of players will be doing pretty badly in a lot of these areas. And it's so much edge uh, to be gained if you can get it back in alignment. So yeah, glad you said that. Ready? How about yourself? What are some of the, what was one, what's the biggest lesson you've learned throughout your poker career? 
the biggest lessons I learned throughout my poker career. Man, you're putting me on the spot here. I thought I was a podcaster, not, not, not the person being interviewed. The biggest life lesson I learned throughout my poker career. Uh, man, there, there are so many. But for me, one big, big breakthrough moment was actually sort of similar what Sergi described. Uh, I uh, teamed up with Explode777. Uh, and... I remember when we joined, he came up with the idea of that we were going to become the best. And I just always played poker in order to live. So what that did with my brain was like, okay, so if we try to become the best, what are we supposed to be doing on a daily basis in order to become the best, right? So I started to indeed then also think about nutrition, uh, I started to hire coaches in terms of improving my performance. I started to work with a solver because before that I wasn't working with solvers. We started to study other players, everything in order to progress. So I would say that having a big goal or a big picture to go towards will help you then be, become a bit more resourceful and trying to think, okay, how can I get there? And then you get into this path of development in order to get to that goal. And I think it was in the podcast with GVL Star that he also talked about it, why it took him 12 years, not six years. And a big part of it was this. There was no necessity to perform. There was no necessity to become better because he didn't have a big goal. So I would say for me, that was one of the biggest lessons. I don't think without uh, being in that environment uh, that I was with him saying that we are going to become the best. Uh, yeah, I would not have reached the, the levels that I've reached for sure. I feel it's uh, very important to be uh, cautious with um, with like setting this uh, very high goals for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I've set well not not the similar ones, but I've I've had goals of becoming the player who who has won the most throughout the calendar year. But mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, a pretty significant goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I set up, in, set up that goal in January. I don't remember the year. And uh, roughly in a, like, I don't know, in a three months time, I realized that it would be very tough. And mm -hmm. realizing that the it it will be tough for you to accomplish your goal is mentally very draining. So I feel uh, the strategy that has been working for me throughout those years is to set uh, two goals. The first goal is the one that it is very likely that you will uh, achieve, and the second one is that first one plus let's say I don't know. 10 to 15 percent uh, if we, we can uh, can say like that I think a big problem with big goals if you limit it to a time constraint I think that's usually where it goes wrong for example when we two things the time constraint and also how black and white you take it for example I never I never was the best poker player in the world and that was actually also not really the point it's more in trying to become the best you're more likely to reach number 10, then if you wouldn't try to become the best, you would probably strand at number 50, right? So let's say, for example, you set out to make a million, okay? You're maybe not likely to make that million, but if you your goal is to make 100K, you will reach 100K, but not 500K. Whereas if your goal is to make a million, you might reach 500K, which is still higher than the 100K. Even though you didn't reach your goal, you still made more money. Do you, do you kind of get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I see your point. Yeah, behind it's being... it's more it's more it's more that you then think resourceful, and the, the problem with the time constraint is that as you said, after three months when it's not working, you're like, ah, it's not gonna work. I only have nine months left, so you quit. Whereas if there's no time constraint and it's not working, you're gonna try to be, think about okay, it's not working the way I'm currently doing it. How can I improve? What are my current leaks? And this can be uh, work life balance related or strategically related or whatever in order to become at least closer to that goal you need to have you need to have something pulling you forward like 
a drive that you want to try to get somewhere. You need to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning and be like, ah, this is what I'm working towards. Uh, I didn't say that uh, I gave up. Uh, I said that it was uh, mentally more tough to, ah, okay. mm -hmm. to realize that it will be less likely that you accomplish the goal that you had set up three months before. Yeah, and it can also be demotivating. And I think especially if you put time constraint on, for example, playing a certain stake, then, you know, certain things are out of your control. You might take a shot, the shots don't work out. That's extra frustrating and you build up extra stress because, oh shit, now I only have six months left to reach my goal of that stake. Oh, I don't have time to grind out now on these lower stakes. Oh, why is this downswing here? I only have six months left. I can see a narrative like that becoming very stressful in the mind where if you're just like, listen, Still the goal, I'm going to reach it. I don't know when, but when I'm ready, I'll, I'll try it again. It's way more peaceful. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you hear yeah. the difference in terms of when I explain it? Um, I, had a, I had a question. Um, you said that you were trying to take shots at 2K. I think you tried six times and the sixth time you, you, you succeeded. What do you think set at the 2K guys apart from the guys that you were used to playing with at like 500 NL, 600 NL, 1K NL? Well, first of all, they had uh, the, the names that were recognized in all of the high stakes community. I'm talking about the guys like OTB, um, F My Life, and Poker Stars, that uh, was a huge winner at that time. Um, he's actually F, F my life is actually one of the guys that had the biggest impact in my poker career. He was he was oh, a really? bit like my what what was uh, Jason for you? He was a bit like me. Yeah, when I started to play poker, I think eleven years. Let's say eleven twelve years ago, I moved to Malta and I was in a house with F my life, Scarface, VOT. You probably remember as well. Yeah, yeah. And then especially back playing? then, no, no, he's uh, he lives the retired life in Portugal. Uh, but he, so he was already playing 5k back then. And me and Scarface, we were playing 200. So you can imagine the gap, right? And I remember back then he was only 17. Uh, Pokestar is aware of this by now. Uh, he was playing, I think, on his mother's account. And in the end, you know, he, he settled it. But it was like a 17-year-old kid playing 5k. And yeah, he was, uh, he, he was very smart. And he taught us a lot of things about poker, uh, that helped us uh, progress throughout the career. So interesting that that you that you that that you named him. But he was definitely um, yeah, I remember he was definitely one of the one of the end bosses on PokerStars back then, two K five K. I remember that I uh, caught a little bit of time playing against uh, uh, for Haley, and uh, that's a Russian about, legend, right? Yeah, for Haley, um, I have not played any hands with true teller at that time what about um, claw viper um yeah i recognize that name um there have been rumors that uh, he was cheating really even at, the, even at that time um yeah i do recall um, he at some point because he would move down and up through stakes like crazy and then he would play 10k heads up against for Haley, and then a month later you would see him grind 200k hands on 100 and l yeah, heads up, probably did not <laughs> did not go well. Um, yeah, so OTB, Linus. Um, I guess there probably were some other guys, uh, very good ones. Mm, I don't recall their names. So I guess when you move up in stakes and start playing against uh, very recognized players, you have that additional burden on you. So uh, maybe their, their strategy is not, that does not have a, a significant edge over you, but the fact that uh, you know that they are recognized and they're recognized to be one of the best players, players in the world um, they, that fact gives them uh, additional advantage over you. And that's probably what happened with me 
um, during those five shots at 2KNL. So I guess I overestimated uh, how good those sub players were and I gave them too much credit. Let's say, for example, uh, to be able to bluff in every single spot that I called them down. So uh, yeah, and once I uh, uh, get calmer, I, uh, yeah, I started playing better and yeah, I managed to, to establish myself at those tables. Nowadays you play uh, all the way up to 100 KNL. I'm gonna yeah. sort of then repeat when the question. Chance. What's the difference between a 2 KNL rec and a 100 uh -huh. KNL rec? Is there a difference or is it all in our head? Well, there is uh, quite a difference. Um, there is uh, a quote by True Teller who said that uh, everyone is scared money. It's just a matter of finding that point of when someone becomes uh, vulnerable to the stakes they're playing. So uh, I feel that a lot of guys who, who play those stakes are not rolled to play there. And that uh, I feel limits to some extent how they can play. Um, for example, playing to KNL, a lot of people have, let's say, 50 to 100 buy-ins at those stakes, meaning that you know, they make uh, five large bluffs, with all of them which are unsuccessful, that does not uh, impact their bankroll all that much. However, if you make uh, five marginal plays at 100 KNL, that means that maybe half of your bankroll is gone. And that, that fact uh, influences how people play. I feel that games can get a little bit neatier with those uh, players with scared money uh, at the table. However, the opposite is also true. Uh, if some, let's say, Chinese businessmen uh, sit uh, at the table and start playing, um, they probably have infinite bankrolls. That means that scared money is not a concept that can be applied to them. So the game becomes a madness in that case. And being able to play in that madness is also a skill because that, that's probably not what uh, a lot of players are used to. Let's say that your regular stake is 5K and uh, you are used to, let's say, plus 50K, minus 50K swings a day. And that's okay for you. You're fine with that. However, a madness at 100K means plus a million, minus a million swings per day. And that's a completely different story. And you really have to have steel nerves as well as uh, a large enough bankroll to you know in order to uh, deal with that and the pressure. Interesting. So there's like an before you make the bluff, so before you shove your stack in, you, you get into a spot like, yeah, I'm going to have to shove my stack in here. Not very happy about it. Why do I get to this scenario? It's a hundred K. I would prefer to make this bluff for 5k. That's kind of, a, so if you have like your decision-making in your brain, let's say it's a battery, you have a hundred percent, a little part of it can be taken, as you mentioned before, by the fear factor of other players. So basically before the hand start, you already wasted 10% of your brain power to like, oh shit, I'm playing against Linus. And then there's like an extra 10% being taken away of like, oh, I don't want to bluff my stack away for a hundred K. So basically you have less brain power left to make a good decision. That's kind of how, how, I, how I'm interpreting this. Um, I'm not saying that it's uh, my thought process necessarily. I feel that, uh, well, the way you described it could be very true for some people that are playing there who are not rolled. 
and uh, by not short, I mean that uh, they do not have 50 binds at those mm -hmm. things. So I cannot only uh, speculate about uh, the um, the depth of uh, each player's uh, bankroll, but I feel that yeah, some guys definitely do not have enough money to comfortably play there. One thing I also noticed in, for example, take high stakes, I, I say cash games compared to mid stakes cash games is the time they take for their decisions. I feel like on every street, there's being way more time, time used than on mid stakes, for example, which I think is good advice for mid stakes players to take time for your decisions. I think this is something that I always see different. High stakes games always take way more time for their decisions to figure out a play that they want to make. Have you noticed this as well? Well, I'm probably the, the person who uses the most uh, time to make uh, my own decisions. And some people get uh, pretty annoyed by that. Um, for example, uh, every every single time I play against uh, Yasam Gale, mm -hmm. uh, the high stakes drags, he, he tries to troll me that uh, I'm very slow with making my decisions. Um, I guess, well, I can explain my uh, thought process behind that. So uh, a lot of, um, a lot of decisions are, especially on the river, are not, uh, not snap decisions. Let's say you have to make a marginal bluff or you have to make a marginal hero call. Um, so they are marginal, mar originally. So you have to think a lot uh, about a lot of um, a lot of factors in order to to make a better decision. And uh, let's say you now have not not a bluff but a value hand, and you somehow want to be balanced in that pot so that uh, your opponents are not able to read you. And because of that, you have to use. Uh, a significant amount of time, not only with your bluff, but also with your value hand. Do you see my point behind being balanced? Yes, no, no. Uh, I how, mean, how much time you use? Mm -hmm. Timing tells exist in online poker. That's uh, that's 100% for sure, especially when you get to lower stakes. But I, I think also, yeah, also, especially when you get to high stakes, yeah, like you said, also people are smarter. You have to take a bit more time for your decisions. People will read through things if you don't think about it correctly. Also, it helps that especially, you know, the, most of the big online big online cash games happen on either GG, ACR, and both sides have, what, a 100-second time bank or something? So um, that also I helps. believe it's uh, 80 seconds on ACR. 80 seconds. But yeah, that's, that's more than enough. <laughs> Compared to in the past, you know, when people played mainly on PokerStars, uh, yeah. And at some point, I remember also they they made it even shorter. You don't have that much time for your decisions. Um, but yeah, very very good point. Going, uh, speaking about um, going further into stake. What motivates you is always to jump into the next stake. If you play a hundred k and L, what is the next stake? Is there a next stake after hundred k and L? Do we have to transition into live poker? I've played live poker a couple of times, uh, only a couple of times, probably to your surprise uh, in my career. And the game has been quite, um, quite boring. I didn't like that. So maybe um, in GG, um, at, at some point would uh, announce higher stakes tables, even higher than 100K, maybe I'll give them a shot. But for now, I feel that uh, yeah, 100k online is is a pretty pretty nice game to play. So it, it didn't arrive yeah, to the yeah, point yeah. where it got boring. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, sometimes it's not just one table of 100k. Um, sometimes there are four tables running, like like for example. Two years ago, I believe, uh, there were games against Chinese businessmen. Um, 
there were roughly two weeks of action from what I know. And that's uh, quite a lot of uh, volume you can put in. You mentioned that you did hop a little bit in the live environment. Did you, you did actually mention you didn't like it that much. Were there any differences that you noticed playing live compared to online? Oh, it seemed like a completely different game, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, so the ranges were uh, way different. Um, like everything was different. Ranges, frequencies, bed sizes, stack sizes, um, the pace of the game, the, the environment. Uh, so I bas basically was having uh, less fun than, uh, than I had online. So maybe one day I'll give it one more try. You maybe also considered uh, in terms of the, you said that you would often get bored if there's no more, more, more challenge. Considered, for example, switching formats again, you went from cap to 100 BB cash, maybe add in some high rollers, tournaments, stuff like that. I have not really studied tournaments. Um, so and I feel that they do not really uh, suit me all that much because you'll have to play um, long sessions in those um, MPTs. Um, I feel that my sweet spot is playing roughly two and a half to three hour sessions. And uh, by doing that, I can uh, give the most of myself, leave the most of myself <laughs> at poker tables. And uh, yeah, playing nine to let's say 12 hour sessions like uh, tournament professionals do is just not, not a thing that I would like to do myself. Yeah, it's a different, you need to be, your C game and B game need to be very good at tournaments, whereas in poker, you can just focus on playing your A game very well. And like you said, restrict certain durations of sessions and try to show up on your A game more frequently. It's a, also because of, you know, cash games is a bit more static, so we can go into very small nuances and try to get very close to, for example, GTO, whereas in tournaments, stack size keeps on changing. You have ICM, blah, blah, blah. So you have to, to also, in terms of the way you study, you have to take a way more uh, holistic view of the game. So maybe that also is maybe less suits you or less attracts you. Yeah, maybe uh, if I started my career with uh, playing tournaments, then uh, we would have had a different discussion now, and I would have I would have had a different view on uh, on what what worked best for me. So, so what are you currently most excited for in poker? You wake up, you're like, ah, it's another day at the tables. What fires you up? There is uh, one idea that um, I constantly think about. Um, that's the number of mistakes I, I make every single session. And so I'm looking forward to eliminating those mistakes. And I can't wait when I become a better version of myself and see how, what my results will be. So uh, I feel that I have not uh, realized my uh, true potential in poker and that's what motivates me. So I feel that there is a lot of work that can be done in terms of improvement. And I'm just very curious of where it can bring me. So you look at your results like, wow, I still make all these mistakes. And you know, you're, you're, you're quite a decent poker player. Imagine, imagine the results I could have if I would eliminate these mistakes. What are some common returning mistakes that you keep on falling into? Well, one of the most common that uh, I have already touched uh, a little bit is uh, not quitting when uh, when I should when I should quit. Um, so some of the mistakes are technical, um, 
like for example there are certain spots that i feel that i should not be paying off mm -hmm. at the same time there are other spots that i should be more um, i should deviate wider than i do not nowadays so in spots where people always bluff you should always call not not should always call but you you can have an expositive strategy of uh debating as much as you could and uh, call as much as you could um these are like technical moments and yeah other moments are mental game moments for example i'm pretty sure that my uh, self-discipline could have been better so uh yeah basically i have a plan like let's say a plan for for the session that i'm going to play and i do not always stick to it if i started sticking to it better or more frequently at least then i'm pretty sure my results would have been uh, better what happens that you sometimes mid-session abandon the plan or not are not able to execute your intentions for the session the way you would like to what kind of throws you out of balance huh. um i'd rather keep it private to be honest <laughs> uh, some some random guy tilting me i don't want to say any names <laughs> oh you mean like you don't want people to throw to start throwing you off during while um, playing for example for example it, it can be just you losing five buy-ins within 10 minutes and that kind of sets you off it's not something that people could exploit you on uh, uh it, it's usually not uh, about winning or losing it's more about uh being immersed into the game uh, too much so i uh, i get so into the game that I, I sometimes forget about uh, the plan that I had prior session. Mm, okay. This is, so, it's interesting. Actually, you're, you're describing now as being too immersed as actually sort of a problem because you kind of fall back into autopilot, like habits that you're trying to break. Um, yeah, you, you got that right. So, so there are two sides of, uh, uh being too immersed into the game the first one is that it helps you to some degree uh with uh motivating you for further improvement studying and battling against uh, the better and better opposition however from the other side yeah it could be mm, a little bit detrimental i feel that uh you should I'm not sure that's the right way to say it. Uh, I feel that you should always be aware of what's going on. And uh, when you are immersed into the game um, too much, that awareness is not always present. That's how uh, I do it. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I can definitely relate to, to what you're saying. I'm also curious, uh, what are some things that happen at the tables that still upset you up until today, even though, you know, you know, it shouldn't upset you, but it still throws you off. Do you still have, do you still have some bad habits in that regards other than the playing too long? In terms of things that upset me, I can't think of many. Well, maybe hit and running is not a good thing. Um, And it's not uh, about, let's say, recreational players hit and running. It's about regulars hit and running. <laughs> For example, they uh, sit playing um, three max against me and some other guy. They play, let's say, 50 hands, win a couple of buy-ins, and they, then they run away. It's, it's even not about being upset. It just feels that, that something is wrong about those those guys if he if they sit down and play then play do not run okay this is this is war, war, warning to the poker world don't hit and run sergi stop doing it 
Adam, is there any hit and running in the heads up sitting go world? You you win you win five matches in a row, the sixth one you lose, then you quit. Not amongst the regulars very often, because basically in heads up sitting goes, you'll basically sit down to play whoever's in the lobby and you're challenging them in that moment. And you'll generally load up more tables against that opponent and play for a period of time. You've often got them on Skype, so you'll arrange how many tables you're going to play. In Germany, it's kind of etiquette for to play at least 30 minutes to an hour. Very often they go on for much more hours. So yeah, the same as Sergi said, it'd be very frustrating for a regular to sit you and then quit after winning four or five buy-ins. It occasionally happens to me when I was playing lots of tables and I have like seven or eight tables and then someone would sit my higher buy-in and then a regular from a lower stake, take your buy-ins off me and then stop. But yeah, it's very infuriating because it's just like a, just doesn't feel fair. It feels like, okay, either we're playing or we're not playing. Make your mind up. You've sat me, you're here. What, what's going on? So it gives us like the, the kind of fighter in you and the kind of fairness in you. It goes, oh, this is annoying. But it's very uncommon in the heads up sitting go world because it's very frowned upon. And yeah, players who do that won't get very far because the heads up sitting go world, you need to uh, make friends along the way to kind of share lobbies over time. So those approaches very, very quickly alienate you and you won't have many friends in poke out that approach. But yeah, I can relate to that. Fish, obviously fish, hit and run all the time. It's just part of them. They have a good time. It's not, not the same. So... Yeah, I can and I guess it's that. also not, it wouldn't also be a problem if you're up to pints and then they lose, right? It's more that if they win body of you, then they run. It's like, what? Well, I cannot win it back anymore. That's kind of the problem. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you haven't got the opportunity to win those buy-ins back. And it's like, it's such a short-term mindset from them. It's like, wait a second, you literally came to uh, run good and then go away. And in your head, you're like, you've got my money. You've literally just taken my money and you're gone. Give me an opportunity to, to play back for it. So uh, yeah, there's something something trigger something like internally that's not quite fair. Uh, yeah, like I said, I didn't run into it very often in my career because it's kind of frowned upon. But yeah, it can relate to it being frustrated for, for Sergi for sure. I've had a very interesting you talk about the high stakes games, the, the nosebleeds in particular, and the psychology of those games and how people are like kind of scared money, like the true teller quote, everyone's scared money. And that, that was really fascinating for me because I, I would have thought like the 5Ks and 10Ks would play quite similar in terms of psychology. But the way you explain it, like almost once you get 100Ks, there's not many people sitting with 50 buy-ins, like 5 million. So there's a lot of people maybe under roll to play those games. So I love the dynamics you spoke about where basically everyone's, well, a lot of players are playing a bit tighter in those scenarios, the scared money guys, which creates a dynamic of a tighter game. And then you have the other scenario where if a Chinese businessman comes in, it's like the wild, wild west. So you've gone from this very rigid game to a crazy town. So it must be really like, for those guys who are kind of the scared money, it must be a big skill set to learn how to survive and thrive in those environments and it must create big edges uh, when you're able to be someone who plays your a good game solid game you're not scared money when those scenarios come up it must create a massive deviation where some players make all their money during those wild periods and other players lose it all and yeah it reminds me of um, a story i heard michael jordan about michael jordan where he arrived at a golf course in england and he, he was meeting up with some football players and he was going to play golf he's a very keen golfer and they said oh do you want to play for money do you want to bet on on the holes and Michael Jordan went, sure. And the guy went, how much would you like to bet per hole? And Michael Jordan said, whatever makes you feel uncomfortable. And he's basically trying to find the point where he's like, I know there's an amount of money where you're going to deviate a lot and you're going to be scared money on this golf course. So yeah, it's the same kind of philosophy where it's like, everyone's got a tipping point where things get uncomfortable and you're unable to uh, play your best strategy when things are high. So yeah, that was really fascinating. I just wanted to retouch on that. I think it was, uh, I think a lot of players who haven't thought about the nosebleeds in those ways, but maybe I think everyone's a robot at that time and they're so immune to swings of money. But in reality, it's, it's people playing for large amounts of money and the psychology of those games is different to other games. And that's often the difference between a good 5K regular who can play his solid strategy at 5Ks, but put him in a 100K pool. All of a sudden, even the strategy might be good enough to uh, play there, but he, he can't he can't do it because of the implications there. So yeah, very interesting. All right, final question from me, and then I'll let you run this sum up. If you could go back to when you were struggling to move up, let's say it was maybe breaking at 2Ks or maybe at mid-stakes, and you had to give yourself some tips or advice from your wise self who's currently playing 100K now, what would be some of the advice you would give to yourself? That's a nice question again from you, Adam. Um, let me think for a second. I guess uh, I would say to myself that um, mental game is uh, as equally important as the technical game. So I would not focus on improving only the latter. So uh, yeah, I would work on both simultaneously and by 
if if I did that, I probably would have uh, uh, would have gone through those struggle periods way way easier and way faster. Um, speaking of uh, yeah, studying the technical game. Again, we touched a little bit um, about what I will just I will say in a moment uh, on our podcast. So uh, I would I would ask myself why I'm do doing an action that I'm doing. Um, I would not. Um, um, I would I would not do some stuff just because someone said me to do that or uh, it is written in an article to do that. I would try to find the real reason behind a certain action or play or a bet size uh, or a range. And yeah, just I would probably be more curious about the game than I originally was. So poker can be a very fun and uh, yeah, exciting, exciting place to be in. And you know, I feel that um, modern studying, which implies a lot of uh, solar work, takes away that opportunity for excitement and uh, basically having fun. So, to sum up, I would try to be more, more happy with my journey, uh, more fulfilled with what I do, and more, more curious about, about the game itself. Wow, that was amazing. Great, wise advice to you and yourself. Now, I always think it's a good question because often you get to a point in life where you can look back and go, ah, there was a certain period of my life where I was just misapplying certain concepts, I was trying to figure it out, but I was kind of doing it kind of wrong. And then you get a point where you figured it all out and it all makes sense. And you can go back to that moment and go, actually, if I just had a new then that this was the better approach, it would have been a lot easier. So yeah, for you, we can see throughout your career, one of the struggles has been to allow yourself to express yourself, both with strategy and also, uh, yeah, basically to uh, not play this fixed game and this fixed theory-based game, and allowing yourself to uh, yeah, kind of deviate more. That's been like an ongoing challenge for you. And as you've got the point you are now, you can see there's certain parts of your career where you are almost blocking yourself from progress progressing by just almost like following strategies that without knowing the why behind them and not allowing yourself to deviate. And then, yeah, when it comes to uh, other avenues, you're now aware how important mindset is, how important having a balanced lifestyle is in order to get to where you are now. And that it's all going to work out in a good way. So uh, you can enjoy the ride. You can have a fun time playing poker and learning it. It doesn't have to be um, such a slave driving pursuit and there's a lot of enjoyment to have along the way. So yeah, appreciate that. Great answer. Rene, have you got any final questions for Sergi? No, I'm going to ask Sergi if there's any uh, final things that he would like to share with our audience. And uh, if not, we're going to wrap it up. Is there anything you would like to still share? Well, I guess uh, uh, I'm grateful uh, to everyone who I, uh, I have met throughout my uh, poker career. Um, my, my friends, my uh, poker fellows. And uh, I'm very happy that at some point I decided to, to start playing this wonderful game. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if things um, started differently uh, in 2009, um, my life probably would have been very different. And I guess we would not have been sitting here talking about um, aspects of poker in this podcast. So, yeah, I wish uh, everyone good luck, um, both um, in their poker development, and um, I wish them a happy, fulfilling life. Wise words of Sergi. What a guy. What uh, loads of experience that he has shared with our audience today. Adam, what were some of your main takeaways from this conversation? I really enjoyed today's conversation. Such a nice guy. And yeah, very, a lot of wisdom that I shared throughout that conversation. The first thing I want to touch on is 
this kind of permission to express himself. So he went through his early career sticking to kind of rigid strategies and following theory without knowing why he was following it. And throughout his career, it's, it's taken him time to allow himself to, to deviate, to uh, get permission to do what he wants to do. I almost think of it like a child who's going through their life. Your, your parents tell you what to do. And then you get a point where you're a teenager or, or a, an adult. And all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I, I, can, I can do what I want. And this is a freedom, but it's also scary because he's so used to being told what to do. He talked about when he saw Source do a different strategy. And he's like, ah, wait a second, if Source can deviate, then so can I. There's a lot of this trying to uh, um, almost like free himself from the fixed, rigid theory stuff and to express himself more. So that was a really, really good one come out throughout. I really loved his approach to solving the problem of grinding too much. As a performance coach, I love how he did it, where he would journal after each session and he would grade his performance based on how many hours he played and how well he played. And very quickly, after a month, he would see, ah, when I play over X amount of hours, I can see my performance drops off. This gives, gives him a data point to allow him to change that behavior. Like you said, it's still a work in progress. Sometimes we don't always use the data we have, but now he knows when he plays over X amount of time, it's not worth it. It has a negative impact on performance and he's able to change that. So anyone who is grinding too much, who feels like they're having diminished returns in the last few hours of the grind, start scoring your sessions, start grading yourself, be honest with that. And you'll see over time that there's yeah, a sample where you can see, ah, if I play too much, there's a drop off in performance, which often allows you to change that behavior. Next thing was like kind of the work-life balance he talked about. I think I asked him what was different about the high stakes guys compared to mid stakes. And he said, just the, they're more professional in how they approach life. He talked about having good health, good nutrition, good relationships, being happy in themselves. And obviously this guy is around a lot of high stakes players playing the biggest games in the world. And he says, that's one of the common things he sees players who are not only look at the technical game, but actually becoming better people and actually holistically approaching performance and poker. You mentioned sleep a few times as well in terms of making sure he's rested so he can play his best poker. So yeah, I like how balanced he was overall. And then also when I said like, what would be the thing that would make your success quicker or what lesson could you learn to or advice to give yourself? One thing he said, uh, mindset. He'd work on his mindset more. I should have probed him a little bit deeper on what he would have done at that time to work on his mindset. Uh, but yeah, I think anyone who's exploring that, give me a shout out. Uh, uh, go on my YouTube channel. I've got tons of free content. But yeah, mindset and performance. Um, very glad to hear that. He raised that highly. Obviously, this guy's a technical wizard. Maths, maths degree, master's level. Guy's very, very smart, but also he understands other factors that contribute to performance. So yeah, really good conversation. How about yourself, Renee? What's some of the major notes that you brought down? Yeah, you already pointed out a lot of good ones, especially the fact that poker success is made up out of more than just the technical section. I think you even gave that as an example that players are stuck and they've at mid six, for example, and they think that what they need is more technical knowledge. Uh, and then even, for example, if they are very solver, solver oriented, more theory. It can be that maybe you should look more at exploitative plays within within the strategical aspect, but it can also be that you have to look at your mindset, your performance, the way you're managing your career, the way you've set it up your environment, your game selection, your side selection. There's so much elements that go into being a good, successful poker player. I think in the end, you know, the strategical aspect of it is maybe only 25%. Yet, this is where people spend almost all their time and it's the only thing that people think about when they think about improving themselves as a player. Remember, I think this was in the Pat's episode that he said that, oh, this month I'm working on volume, working on adding an extra table or improving or adding a little bit to my current session duration. These are all ways that you can also improve as a poker player that are often overlooked. So yeah, I think that is, uh, um, that is that's some very good advice. You already mentioned as well, right? The breaking free. You don't have to do anything, right? Understand why something is like that in theory. And then a key word that he mentioned was curiosity. Be curious. If you look, you will find different ways, right? And sometimes it is also in the permission. Take Stefan, for example, that uh, I really like that we got into him a little bit. He used Stefan as an example. He also used OTB, I think, as an example. Um by studying these, the way that they play, it kind of gives him permission of, okay, they're doing all these kind of things and it inspires him and it makes him curious for, oh, wow, so you can also win like that. What else is out there, right? And then he mm -hmm. said that he kind of, instead of having one fixed way of playing, he kind of understood what that way of playing was trying to achieve. And he understood that based on 
various types of players, we could achieve it by taking different lines. So therefore, his game became more creative. I think that, uh, yeah, those were definitely, for me, some of the main takeaways. Also, definitely in terms of studying better players, seeing what they're doing, uh, it can be very inspirational as well. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. I really liked this episode. I hope you guys liked it as well. I want to thank my co-host Adam for providing all his wisdom. I want to thank again Sergi for agreeing to come on and share his journey with us. I would like to see you guys leave a good review, comment, give a like. You know how it works. Really helps the channel. And I would like to see you guys in the next episode for more wisdom.